We finished in the last video talking about the fluid environments of cells. Recall that the fluid found outside cells is called the extracellular fluid. So that's what's labeled here. So this is the outside of our cell. And the fluid inside is called the intracellular fluid. So that's the intracellular side here. So what divides us, what separates the outside extracellular fluid from the inside intracellular fluid is the plasma membrane. And you can see by looking at its structure it's quite complex, not nearly as simple as it might look in a model, but if we examine it microscopically we can see there's a number of different molecules working together to provide the structure and function of the plasma membrane. So this is what separates our cells from the extracellular fluid. And this membrane is what we call selectively permeable. And selectively means that only certain things are able to pass through it. The permeable means that items can go from inside the cell to the outside of the cell, from intracellular to extracellular, or from extracellular to intracellular. So if it's a waste product or it's something produced by a cell, for example insulin, it needs to leave the cell to go and act on other cells. So that would be something leaving the cell and if we're talking about a nutrient such as glucose that we get through digestion, that needs to enter cells, so that's coming from the outside in. So we have this plasma membrane that substances need to pass through, but only certain things can pass through. So we say again, it's selectively permeable. If we look at the outside of the cell, there's some specific molecules which are made up of, uh, have a sugar component to them, and that's where the glyco prefix comes from because they have a carbohydrate molecule associated with them. So there is what's called the glycoprotein that we can see. It's a protein molecule with a sugar attached to it on this end, which is extending into the extracellular fluid. And then we also have glycolipids. We can see these circular structures here. These are phospholipids, and if they have a sugar molecule attached to them, we call them glycolipids. And these sugary external molecules here on the external surface of the plasma membrane act as markers to help cells communicate and recognize one another. So these are very important, for example, for the sperm cell to find the egg. The sperm looks for the right, correct pattern of these sugar molecules extending from the surface of the egg. The immune system also is able to recognize foreign cells from self cells by looking at the pattern of carbohydrates on the external surface of different cells that it may come in contact with. So these external carbohydrates serve as markers for communication. And then if we look at our next slide here, Looking at the overall structure of the cell, we say it is a fluid mosaic structure. Oops. And what that means is that fluid refers to that the surface of the cell is changing. It's not just a constant structure. Things can move about the surface. And I have a video animation to kind of demonstrate this. The mosaic um, refers to the fact that it's changing and it's made up of a variety of different molecules. So we'll watch this video quickly here. What do fried canaries, pickle juice, and coffee have in common? Between the, Between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Throw in some cholesterol and a few carbohydrates and you have the basic structure of a plasma membrane. Within these lipid molecules, we also find different proteins which do various things for the cell. For instance, they receive signals from the world outside or they transport nutrients and waste. So nature composes the membrane with a combination or mosaic of different lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And these molecules are not stationary. They constantly move within the structure, fluidly changing their positions. 
the survival of all life rests on this veil of material. A supple membrane, just two molecules thick. So again, we can see that it's much more complex than it would appear in looking at a model from lab. We have the phospholipids, which form the structure of the membrane. So these ball, little circular structures with the tails, those are the phospholipid molecules. And it's important to understand the structure of those and their function in the sense that the circular portion, the head of these phospholipids, attract water-soluble substances. For example, glucose and different ions, salts, are attracted to the surface of our cells because of these water-loving polar heads of the phospholipid molecule. But the tail portion, the core of the plasma membrane, actually repels water. These um, molecules here are nonpolar. And it's not as important that you understand polar versus nonpolar right now chemically, but just that you understand that the core of the plasma membrane repels water and the surface attracts water. So we can attract water-soluble substances to the surface, but they're going to need a transporter to get them across this membrane because they can't dissolve in this oily inner portion, just like water and oil don't mix. This is an oily inner core that will not dissolve any water-soluble substances. Only things that are not water-soluble, nonpolar substances like carbon dioxide, oxygen, alcohol, those are things that can dissolve through that fatty core. Other substances that are water soluble, like we said, salts and sugars and different proteins, they need to go through a transporter. So here's an example of a channel, a protein channel, that might be specific to a water soluble substance and that will allow it to pass through the cell membrane either in and travel either in or out of the cell. Another important structure we see in the plasma membrane are these cholesterol molecules. You can see they're embedded in the fatty portion of the plasma membrane in this nonpolar region. And these provide integrity or stiffness to the plasma membrane. Because you saw in the video how these um, phospholipid molecules can be separated from one another if the plasma membrane is bumped. But the cholesterol stiffens it up a little bit so it stays intact and doesn't completely break apart. So cholesterol is important for our cell membrane. So when you hear that people should lower their cholesterol in their diet, that's true. But our liver makes cholesterol to, to help with hormone production because many of our hormones are, um, have cholesterol as a structural foundation. And also our plasma membranes require cholesterol to keep them intact. So cholesterol is important. We just don't need extra cholesterol in our diet. Our liver makes all the cholesterol we need. So looking at the structures then, we have the carbohydrates extending from the surface. We have these large globular proteins. We'll talk more about their structure in a little bit. We have cholesterol embedded in the membrane and the phospholipid molecules that form the basic structure. So think of the phospholipid molecules here as the brick and mortar of the plasma membrane. So looking at proteins then, these different proteins actually determine the function of the membrane. So some of these proteins might extend from one side to the other, and um, they can be embedded in the membrane, or they might be just on one side or another, depending if they're an enzyme. But either way, these are long chains of amino acids. In A and P, because we're not a chemistry class, we just show proteins as large globular materials. That's what they look like you know, under the microscope, but if we looked at them chemically, we would see that they're long chains of amino acids linked by peptide bonds. You should have learned that in chemistry class. Maybe you don't remember the details anymore, but that's okay. So we have different types of proteins. Peripheral proteins are not embedded in the membrane. They're more loosely attached, so they might help link different cells together, um, like I said, or act as enzymes. Again, these carbohydrate molecules act as markers for cell communication, and this one is attached to a protein, so this is called a glycoprotein. If this carbohydrate molecule here, this yellow structure, if that was attached to a phospholipid molecule, then we would call it a glycolipid. But either way, these extend off the surface of the cell and serve for communication and recognition of cells. Some of these proteins serve as channels. Like I said, if a, if a substance is water-soluble, it cannot dissolve in this fatty core, so it needs to travel through channels. Some of those channels are open always, and things can freely flow through according to their concentration differences, 
or other channels have uh, gates on them. We call them gated channels and depending on the type of gate um, and what the conditions have to be to open those gates we have what are called ligand gated channels which means some type of molecule has to bind in order to open up the channel and voltage gated channels means there has to be a change in ion concentration on either side of a membrane to open up those channels. I certainly don't expect you to know the details of that at this early stage in the semester, but we will have many examples of these as we proceed through the different body systems, particularly in the nervous system and the muscular system. So here we can see an example of a gated channel. Here acetylcholine has to bind in order for this channel to open and allow these pink sodium ions into the cell. So this would be an example of a ligand gated channel because it requires a chemical to bind to it. The chemical is another name for it is a ligand. So the ligand in this case is acetylcholine. When it binds it causes this channel to open up and allows sodium to come through. So acetylcholine isn't passing into the cell. It's only acting as a key to open up the channel and allow sodium into the cell. So there's a little animation here we can watch that shows this in action. The sodium channel has receptor sites for a ligand acetylcholine. The sodium channel has receptor sites for a ligand acetylcholine. When the receptor sites are not occupied by acetylcholine, the sodium channel remains closed. When acetylcholine binds to its receptors, the channel opens. Therefore, the channel is called a ligand-gated ion channel. When the channel opens, sodium ions diffuse through and enter the cell. Okay, so that's the, the ligand-gated channel with special receptors. Other proteins that we see in the cell, again, uh, these are um, determining the function of the cell. So we find these embedded in the plasma membrane. Here's an example of a protein serving as an enzyme. Here we have a molecule made up of two amino acids with a peptide bond. As it interacts with this enzyme found on this cell, that bond is broken by this enzyme and those amino acids are separated from one another and can be combined in a different way to form a different protein. So this is an example of an enzyme protein. Here's an example of a carrier protein. Here there's a molecule that is that binds with this carrier protein. The protein changes its shape and transports that molecule to the other side. So it's not necessarily a channel because the protein actually changes its shape and interacts with the molecule to put it on the other side of the membrane. So it's a way of transporting water-soluble substances in a little bit of a different form. So again, these are all special functions of cells that are determined by the type of proteins found in the plasma membrane. So again, the phospholipids determine the structure of the membrane and the proteins determine the function of the membrane. Be sure that you can link those two um, functions and um, relationships between phospholipids and proteins.